uh, agreed on a regulatory basis, then you can very quickly pop in another variant. But for this um, winter, for the next four months? Um, so, so we're already prepared for this winter. We have no reason, I think, to... In terms of vaccine capacity for new variants? So I think we, the uh, view would be that the current vaccines that we have will give, whilst uh, our current one, for example, uh, both of the uh, bivalents that are being used here are active against uh, Omicron and the original, what we call the wild-type strain. Mm. And that breadth of valency uh, should allow, I think, uh, us to manage new variants coming through. Most of the ones, as uh, Dr. Waiters said, are actually coming through their, their lineages related to uh, Omicron at the moment. Well, they have done, but um, uh, Omicron turned out to be less bad than feared. We were set yep. for a lockdown last Christmas until it became established and the cabinet, the cabinet were not persuaded this was necessary. It turned out that uh, the existing vaccines were effective against Omicron, but the expectation um, at least entertain the possibility they might not be, and so this might happen in the future. So just specifically on that, um, do we have the the necessary contract um, signed yet with Moderna, for example, to supply <coughs> vaccines for a new variant were it to be required? Uh, so the, the Moderna um, uh, agreement, uh, I think, is not yet finalised, but um, clearly they've announced in the media that they are investing uh, research. Uh, why, why isn't it being finalised? Uh, that's now, not really a question for, for me to answer, I'm afraid. I think that would be for, for uh, ministers. But, but actually, the point that you make is, are we working with industry in order to be prepared? And the absolute answer to that is yes. And this is one of the learnings that I think it's really critical to share. We, we have absorbed into the UK Health Security Agency the Vaccine Task Force, and the work with industry is continuing through that group. So, for example, uh, we are working with Moderna as well as with other pharmaceutical companies. One of the um, benefits of the vaccine task force was that the close working relationship meant things could happen quickly, but equally you can signal ahead where the public health risk is and work alongside pharmaceutical aid, and that is continuing now. Well, that is uh, precisely behind my question as to uh, whether we have the agreement signed in advance. In, in our joint inquiry report, um, we observed at paragraph 394 that the decision to procure at risk uh, long in advance of regulatory approval, a broad portfolio of supplies of uh, potential vaccines was bold and prescient, uh, as was the commitment to order vaccines in quantities in excess of what was needed. That came from the, from the vaccines task force. The, the founding chair of that task force, Dame Kate Bingham, has been very clear that she thinks that, that those lessons have been lost, in particular having contracts in place in advance. Um, and it may be a question for the Minister who is waiting to, uh, to take your place, uh, Dame Jenny, but that is a concern, is it not, is if we haven't got the contracts in place that happened under Kate Bingham, and now we don't. So if I, I, I think I will leave it for the Minister to answer the particular detail on the contract, and you'll realise there is likely to be some commercial sensitivity around this, which is, uh, uh, so I think probably uh, I'm not able to go into it in detail. I think the critical point here is we have, uh, all of our vaccines for this winter are here, and we anticipate scientifically that they will cover the population going forward. Not only that, but we have uh, additional supplies ready to use should we need to reboost or re They're there for the current variants. From, for current variants, but my point at the start of this is um, that the likelihood is that those vaccines will give the breadth of protection that would manage a new variant. Now, if in the unlikely situation, a very new variant came or a different pathogen, which I think is the kind of test case. What is the relationship that we have in our growing uh, with pharma uh, and with our scientists? And that is that work of the vaccine task force is continuing. And one of the, for the UK HSA, for example, we have established a vaccine de uh, development and evaluation centre, which is a set up precisely to have a front door for the pharmaceutical agency so it's easy for them to come and work with us when they have new vaccine candidates going through and they are already so there is a lot of work there which i'm very happy to send the detail to the committee of uh, in after this meeting it's so just funny so dame kate bingham is wrong when she says that the uk has lost its leadership um, in 
uh, preparedness uh, when it comes to vaccines and that we've gone back to business as usual. That she's, she's wrong in that assessment, is she? Um, so I, I think she perhaps isn't seeing, I mean I absolutely share uh, Dame, uh, Dame Kate's uh, ambition in this, it's exactly what the UK Health Security Agency wants to do, it's one of the most exciting opportunities in science that's come from uh, the pandemic. Uh, she may not be seeing everything that's happening. The vaccine task force came into uh, the UKHSA on the 1st of October. Clearly we need the prime issue is to move them across safely so that the vaccination programme continues and the country can continue uh, going forward. Uh, but the work is absolutely ongoing and I think that will become evident as our plans materialise. I, I think Dr Wake wanted to, yeah, to could just I, add. Can I maybe yeah. give the example of how this works through the spring and summer to get the bivalent programme we have now uh, off the ground? As during the, uh, over the spring summer uh, UKHSA, the Department of Health, uh, the, VT, the Vaccine Task Force and MHRA worked together to make sure that we purchased and then planned with NHS England um, how we were going to deliver the bivalent programme and that was before BA5, our most recent wave, was even a thing, let alone BA4. Uh, so we made a plan around procuring the BA1 wild type bivalent vaccine because based on information from Horton Down uh, and from other places we were confident that we were procuring a vaccine that would be effective against future variants because up until now wild type has covered all of the variants and still does. There is still wild type activity against BA5, against BQ and so on. So by the time we had licensed via MHRA the BA1 uh, be a wild type vaccine, nobody else had a bivalent vaccine at all. By the time the BA4-5 was licensed and then rolled out in, for example, France in early October, we had already vaccinated 4.6 million people uh, against BA1 wild type combined and those, that started with the oldest age groups. So that's a good example of the process still works. Good. We are still following those, those examples and 4.6 million people were protected who otherwise weren't. And we've gone on to vaccinate 16 million people since then. So it's, it's working well. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Wood. Excellent to hear. Right, Tracy Crowell. Um, before I come on to my specific question to Dame Jenny, um, Dr. Wade, just in a follow up to a question to Rebecca Long Bailey about inequalities and in uptake, discovered from my own case load at the time that people with learning disabilities have quite, many have quite a significant, severe, and debilitating needle phobia. And if I just wondered if you could just update the committee on progress around a nasal spray uh, alternative to, um, uh, for the COVID vaccine. Yes, I'm aware that there are nasal spray vaccines in clinical trials, um, but I think it's important to keep to sort of remain circumspect about those. A lot of products that are in clinical trials do not get to phase two, to phase three, or indeed uh, get to market. So I don't want to sort of put too much hope or expectation on those being delivered quickly. Uh, it is both the mechanism of delivery that is important, so uh, nasal vaccines are absolutely more acceptable to children, as well as a large number of adults um, who are, who are needle phobic. But we need to make sure that this is an effective way of delivering the vaccine. We're not at that stage yet, but it's not just for COVID. I would say it's quite a promising area of delivery for a range of vaccines that are currently delivered via needles. Thank you. Um, Dame Jane, news relating to avian flu is featuring prominently at the moment. Uh, and while it's clear that the risk um, that bird flu poses for humans is very low, it is there uh, and presumably could change uh, and increase. So with that in mind, what steps are being taken to deal with an avian, avian flu crossover to humans? So that is part of our comprehensive biosecurity planning uh, routinely. I think what is particularly challenging this year for a number of reasons is that I think this is the first year where actually normally we'd see a seasonal variation and, and so you would have uh, wild birds uh, not infected. Actually, we're not seeing that. So through this last year, uh, they have retained an infectivity, if you like. And so uh, since just since the 1st of October 22 this year, uh, in that time, we've had 111 infected premises um, and significant numbers of wild birds uh, reported and infected as well. So it feels like a, a slight scale change, uh, and obviously that requires us not only to maintain our current uh, risk alertness, but actually to review in more detail. The, the current pathogen uh, is an H5N1, and one of the issues there is uh, the avian pathogen, H5N1, is um, we actually don't have uh, as much detailed knowledge as we would like to know about that. It appears to be um, a, 
a, a relatively um, low risk, if you like, from a uh, human perspective. Uh, but we have absolutely recognised that we need to understand more. And in fact, a new risk assessment was done last week. And I know uh, Dr. Waite is on that group working with uh, academia uh, and with others to ensure, and with uh, APHA, uh, to ensure that each of those different uh, concerns uh, around uh, risk of transmission, uh, particularly looking at the structural biology, so whether you can see whether uh, antivirals that we have, for example, would work. But uh, while that is ongoing, uh, we continue to work with uh, 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 the APHA. We put zones around. It's, it's their lead, but we support the work there, uh, identifying individuals who could potentially become at risk. So obviously poultry workers, uh, understanding whether on an individual basis, whether they've been wearing appropriate PPE and then advising on antivirals. I mean, there are some challenges because of the numbers here. It takes a lot of time from our local health protection teams increasingly. Um, and also the population themselves of people who are in growth are, are often um, uh, 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 not um, English speakers. Uh, they were becoming so actually translating and getting um, risk communication right for that group can be quite tricky. So, sorry, is there a vaccine in place to deal with an outbreak of um, so they, they humans? So they dealt with, with prophylactic um, antibiotics. I mean, there have been. There, there are. I might also just say, of course, there is an international surveillance program as well, which we are docked into. And one of our concerns is probably uh, more to do with increasing rising cases of, uh, of two or three. Uh, uh, avian flus which have transmitted to humans in China currently. Uh, we have only had one transmission here uh, last Christmas in a, particularly, um, uh, a particular case where the individual was literally living with poultry. Um, so there usually has to be very, very close association between the, uh, the poultry and the human. Uh, and uh, so at the moment, our focus is on ensuring that we prevent any illness developing and we prevent any yeah. risk of onward transmission. Absolutely. There's a huge public interest, obviously, at the yeah. moment in the subject. So we've got Carol Monahan and Rachel Maskell. We're going to conclude this session at 11. So brevity on all sides would be much appreciated. Carol. Thanks. Thanks, Chair. Um, Dame Jenny, I've got four very quick questions. So hopefully I can keep to time and then possibly a, a supplementary on this. Um, first of all, what is UK HSE's budget? It, well, it will, it will vary. We had a one-year settlement, um, and so actually our budget going forward is, uh, is in discussion at the moment. Um, clearly, we were born in the middle of a pandemic to support the management of a pandemic, and that's a very unusual set of circumstances. I thought that should be a straightforward answer. It, it's <laughs> not, I'm afraid. So what, what was last year's budget then? So, so our, our budget, well the budget going back, of course I've inherited predecessor organisations as You're well. You're definitely a politician here, <laughs> Jenny. <Lassie. laughs> um, so so the, the budget is uh, 2.4 billion, but um, I might say that we, uh, that is, part of that is not our, but I'm sorry, I'm not trying to avoid the question. We, uh, as a health family, manage the COVID element across the areas which are most required. So um, given that you cannot predict what the pandemics are doing, if I give an example, lateral flow tests, you allocate a budget against them, uh, but then they're used by other parts of the system and, and they have been underused. Equally, we have stepped down the uh, on-site testing stations because we're using lateral flows and sending tests out directly to individuals ahead of time. So we've done that very efficiently and created an underspend which then goes back into uh, colleagues in the Department of Health who are managing other COVID pressures. So assuming we're in a kind of steady state at the moment, 2.4 billion is kind of a decent estimate. So that is the COVID budget plus, the UK, which includes the UK Health Security Agency component. I mean, I think as we go forward, um, and uh, part of the discussions at the moment is to do with what the UK Health Security Agency, which effectively is the National uh, Health Protection Agency, is the right non-COVID business as usual state to do all of the things which we've described, which to ensure we stand up. But of course, uh, for a number of reasons you said, we're doing uh, MPOX, we're responding, we're supporting asylum seekers, we are uh, supporting work in, in Ukraine, we're doing all sorts of things on a regular basis. So I think the importance is this is a very unusual year, as was last year, 
because of the COVID pandemic. Thank you. I thought that that was only question one. I thought that would be really quick. Um, the, so, how much of the your budget at the moment is for disease surveillance? That's a very difficult question to answer, and I'm happy to try and provide some separate um, estimates of that. And the reason I say it is because uh, some of the learning from the pandemic. Uh, is about, as I think others have said earlier, about ensuring data linkage. So when we think about surveillance, there is uh, things like the Community Infection Survey here, which the, the Commission of which has come through the UK Health Security Agency. Um, but it also includes things like work with uh, on global international health. So uh, we're working with the development of uh, the Berlin Hub, the International Pathogen Surveillance Network. And fundamentally, it includes um, a provision which was in our budget to improve the digital technology and infrastructure, which is absolutely critical to ensure that some of the new systems we have, so things like our second generation surveillance system means somebody, a lab test, so uh, sorry watch, so again, lab tests for respiratory infection in hospitals and other infectious disease come through and we routinely survey. So again, sorry, that's not a straightforward answer, but it's coming from technology, it's coming from international work and a number of other areas. I think it might be useful if you could write to the committee with some sort of figures if, if you could do that. The, the next question should be easier. <laughs> <laughs> um, what is uh, UK HSE's headcount? So uh, at the peak, the combined organisations was actually around 18,000. We 18, are now at, uh, I think, just around 6,700. Um, and it's around 6,500 full-time equivalent. Um, that is not a stable workforce at the moment. So when the organisation came into being, it was only 30% substantive posts, and that reflects the difficult period. Uh, what we're doing now is downsizing in some and increasing substantively in others with variation in size in different places. OK, and um, how many of those individuals are working on disease surveillance? <laughs> I, can I, I will include that yeah. if, if you're welcome. So again. maybe, maybe a, a different question then. You've not quite been able to answer questions on budget, um, headcount, you've given us some idea. Maybe the question then is, is the budget and is the headcount enough for um, horizon scanning the situation we have just now in terms of uh, global threats? So I think it is easier if I come back, and I'm not wishing to detract from the question, but what I'm trying to say is the same individuals, for example, who will be evaluating monkeypox vaccine, again, we put out a publication last week, uh, will also be using those skills to evaluate uh, against new variants. <coughs> the same people who are using building technology are building different systems to link us into hospital data on so every other infectious disease, so MR, uh, uh, on antimicrobial resistance. So I, I'm very, if, if it's just COVID, we would have to proportionalise it, and I'm happy to come back with some Not just COVID, thing. but generally, you know, looking for what is the next threat... Um, so what you're seeing is a lot of people are multitasking within... In, in actual fact, if you look, and this is one of the difficult things to explain uh, as a health security agency, if you, you can't divide a programme budget off very easily, what you need is an infrastructure, digital infrastructure, you need analysts who can turn to different diseases, you need infectious disease experts on different topics, but they will also be the individuals who are leading the response uh, to an instant management team. So if there's an outbreak, you pull them in. So if you start dismantling one bit, often the other bits don't work, which is why giving a, an individual figure is probably not uh, representative, really, of the different inputs to that section. They need to work together. Okay. Thank you. Right, thank you. And then the personification of brevity is Rachel Maskell. From health data. Thank you uh, and good morning. Um, the rapid containment of the virus was absolutely crucial in containing uh, the disease. So turning to track and trace, clearly having a national system, there was inefficiencies within that, whereas locally there was better data, it was more responsive and people knew their own community. So what would you do differently looking forward around containment and track and trace? Uh, so I'll speak actually as, a, as an ex-director of public health and I, I liaise very often with, uh, directly with directors of public health and, have, and understand this from both sides. Um, I think 
uh, when Test and Trace was set up, it was set up at a time when actually local systems could not have coped because of the scale that was required. Um, uh, nevertheless, those local systems continue to work, as do the health protection teams, the UKHSA health protection teams. Um, and I think there is strong recognition uh, that as we go forward, and in fact what we are doing now, is to take the learning from both of those and put them together in a, in a way which works routinely, proportionately, but then is scalable efficiently and effectively uh, when you get something as significant as a pandemic. To some extent, we have tested it actually with the MPOX outbreak because where you get a significant regional uh, or, or national infection, obviously not as, uh, as problematic as the pandemic was for the whole population. Uh, but uh, we've tried that. So one of the examples I give is we now have a single service centre for contact tracing and we can work with directors of public health to either take calls centrally or move them over. And we did actually evaluate the work which uh, local teams had done and national. And what it shows broadly is that uh, for some uh, families particularly, exactly as you say, a local director of public will know their communities. For those ones where they're hard to reach, they would be able to reach them where central systems couldn't. However, for overall for efficiency, actually the central system with large numbers uh, was more efficient. So it's, it's kind of horses for courses in what you're trying to do. The critical point is working together is the important one. And we have a piece of work which uh, UKHSA, myself, co-chairing with uh, Jim McManus from Association of Directors of Public Health, looking at the future of health protection system to really clarify post-pandemic uh, the roles and responsibilities of each bit so that when we go into these urgent mode, we automatically click into uh, the right path, you know, the right streamlined approach, and then we can hand things backwards and forwards as, as appropriate to manage the risk. Mm. Okay, thank you very much. We've covered a huge amount of ground. Uh, Dame Jenny Harries, Dr. Thomas Waite, thank you very much. Change the panels, please. Moving on to, to panel three, this marathon session, we have, for the first time before any part of the Health and Social Care Committee, Neil O'Brien MP, who's the Minister for Primary Care and Public Health at the Department of Health and Social Care, of course, Michelle Dyson, Director General Adult Social Care at the Department, and Clara Swinson, Director General Global Health, also at the Department. Welcome. Sorry to keep you waiting, but I'm sure you enjoyed hearing that evidence. Minister, nice to see you. Um, how much of your time is taken up think other than preparing for today's session? How much how much of your time is taken up thinking about working on COVID? Um, so uh, first thing to say, um, great pleasure to be in front of the, my former committee uh, once again, and um, thank you for having us. I mean, this just to emphasise this uh, piece of work is something we regard as hugely important. It was. Uh, uh, good that we were able to um, uh, support the overwhelming majority of the recommendations in your report, which is incredibly useful. We're obviously also supporting the, the COVID public inquiry, which is uh, in a very forensic way going through all these questions as well. Um, and um, to, come to, to come to your question, I am not the Minister for, um, uh, for UXA. Uh, uh, that is my uh, uh, colleague, Maria Caulfield. Um, I am responsible for primary care and for um, uh, OHID side of uh, public um, health. But nonetheless, uh, uh, the impact of the uh, uh, pandemic on the public health and on primary care uh, was uh, enormous and is something that I have spent a decent amount of time uh, thinking about and uh, following, uh, not just as part of preparing for this committee, but more generally uh, following um, uh, work on how we make sure that we are better prepared for any future pandemic. Yeah, thank you. And, and you're, you're right, I mean, the government did respond or, uh, with acceptance or partial acceptance of pretty much all of the recommendations in our report. I think with, with, to the exclusion of the stuff around the involvement of the army, where they didn't accept our recommendations in, in the way that they were put. But one, one of the things that, that is said in the response is that the government intends to set up a catastrophic emergencies programme to focus on 10 risks which may give rise to whole system emergencies, including pandemics. Could you tell us about 
catastrophic emergencies program. Yeah, so there's, there's qu quite a lot of um, different ways that we have changed our whole approach to pandemics. Um, I think the first thing uh, to say is that there's a change of fundamental approach. Yeah. So uh, we now have a, what we call a kind of pathogen agnostic approach to planning for pandemics. Previously, a criticism that's been made by various people uh, was that the focus was on pandemic flu, which was identified as the uh, kind of number one uh, risk. And now our approach is about thinking about a much uh, wider range of pathogens with different disease characteristics and scenarios. Of course, the thing with COVID was the asymptomatic transmission was the thing that everyone will always come back to. And that sort of capabilities-based approach involves thinking about all the different tools we've got, the diagnostics, the surveillance, the scientific advice, the clinical countermeasures, the border controls, the legislation, all those different tools that we had to, to deploy during this pandemic. The, the other um, second bit of this sort of change of approach is uh, the change of fundamental structures, obviously, so the splitting of PHE, the creation of UXA in October last uh, year. And within UXA, the Centre for Pandemic Preparedness within it is effectively a cell that is like the heart of a kind of global network that uh, involves thinking about um, pandemic uh, preparedness. Um, the, the third thing I'd say about our change of approach is um, a huge, massive improvement in um, surveillance and international coordination on it. Um, so the UK was a founding member of the uh, International Pathogen Surveillance Network, uh, which is there to coordinate uh, international detection of uh, uh, pathogens and also data sharing on emerging threats. And we also found a member of the uh, G7's 100 Days mission, which is there to coordinate work on kind of diagnostics, vaccines and therapies specifically. A sort of fourth thing that is different about how how we would do things differently now is there is this sort of constant improvement work that goes on within UXA, which involves both regular uh, exercises at different scales uh, and also learning from that day-to-day -day response and um, uh, the kind of day-to-day -day activity of managing local outbreaks and particular uh, uh, challenges. And then the sort of fifth and final way we've changed our approach, and we've touched a bit on this in the session already, is, um, is capacity building really. So thinking about in a most straightforward way, you know, the re we are reviewing our requirements uh, for critical countermeasures and things like PPE. Uh, we have already talked in this session a bit about um, the agreement uh, with Moderna for UK development and production of new vaccines to ensure resilience. And uh, NHS Supply Chain and DHSC are also working with PPE manufacturers to make sure that we have resilience of supply chains, which was such an issue at the start of the pandemic all over the world. And now about 75% of the uh, FFP3 masks that are used by the NHS and social care are now made in the UK, up from approximately 0% at the start of the pandemic. So there is an overall um, change of approach to the way we would manage pandemics. Um, and I, if I can bring in Clara on. I'm, not gonna, I, I'm just going just gonna to focus, actually. So obviously you, you, you sat there and you heard uh, Dame Jenny give you a nice pass on Moderna. Uh, so I'm just going to let my fellow chair... Uh, so yes, simple, start. simple question. Um, has it been signed, this, um, this contract? Yes, yeah, so we agree, agreed the heads of terms of the agreement in June. And both at their desire and also our desire, that is uh, the great majority of the agreement. We all wanted to resolve all the main issues of principle in that initial agreement. And so, as it were, the great majority of the negotiation is done. Uh, the but does this illustrate the problem that um, Dame Kate has described? So Dame Kate's time in running the Vaccine Task Force um, went from May to December 2020, mm -hmm. just over mm -hmm. six months. Mm -hmm. Since you agreed the heads of agreement, mm. that accounts for, we're now nearly in December, mm. uh, nearly the whole time that Dame Kate performed her miracles when she was mm. in office. Mm -hmm. Doesn't it show that what she says is true, that you dropped the ball, that you agreed something nearly six months ago, you haven't been able to sign anything beyond heads of terms? Uh, I, I, I don't agree with that, much as I uh, have a huge um, respect for what was achieved so quickly um, by the Vaccines Task Force. Um, on this agreement, which is a, a very long-term uh, agreement, it's a piece of industrial strategy, broadly speaking, a piece of kind of resilience um, architecture. We have, let's be clear, agreed a lot of this. We have agreed that construction of this facility will start next year. We have agreed that vaccine manufacturing in the UK will start 
in 2025. So the great majority of this is agreed, but because of the open-ended nature of it and the ability to flex, we're not just buying one thing here, we're buying a capability to buy uh, respiratory um, uh, uh, vaccines against respiratory viruses of various kinds. Uh, because we are buying a very flexible tool, that is a fundamentally complicated uh, negotiation. I have been uh, across um, some of the more recent rounds of exactly how uh, we land that, and we are extremely close uh, uh, to finalising the remaining detail. But just to reassure you, uh, uh, when you say you haven't signed this thing yet, you've just got some sort of vague agreement in principle, that is not the case. Uh, we have agreed the substantive bulk of all that needs to be agreed, and we are now chasing down the detail would be a better characterisation of where we are at with it. And the reason that takes a few months is not because anybody's dropped the ball, it's because if I was a, if I was them and as I was company, I was opening into a deliberately highly flexible and quite open-ended long-term agreement um, uh, uh, with the government uh, to provide a capability, not just a product, I would also be going quite forensically with my lawyers through the detail of it. I, don't know if that was well, I, won't, I won't pursue any further now, but the our committee might want to take this forward. All I would say is that the evidence that the joint inquiry took during the pandemic was that if we hadn't had signed legally binding contracts, we wouldn't have got the supplies. Oh, uh, when, the, when the balloon went up, lots of other yeah, jurisdictions wanted them. Absolutely and the existence true. of those signed contracts was crucial. But I, the only thing I'd say is there's a slight difference between that global scramble to secure things, which also happened on PP as well as you, as you know, and this, which is a piece of something which we have discussed before, and it leads on actually from John Bell's work back in 2016 and 2017. This is a piece of industrial strategy. It's a piece of resilience architecture. And it's not just like, have you signed a contract in order to buy a thing? This is to get and create a permanent new capability for the UK. And if I okay. might just... Carol Monahan. Thank you. Thank you. Um, in our joint report, uh, there was questions about the, the um, set-up of SAGE and how SAGE operated and was made. And, and one of the um, statements we made was the government's SAGE should facilitate strong external and structured challenge to scientific advice, including from experts in countries around the world and a wider range of disciplines. Mm -hmm. So if I could ask, Minister, have there been any reforms made to SAGE, and if so, what are they? So I think that that is what SAGE uh, does do. So SAGE drew on something like 240 different participants during the pandemic uh, response. And of course, it's not the only advisory group we've got. We've also got NervTag and JCVI. And they drew on a very, very wide pool of expertise from very, very many um, uh, disciplines. They build on top of the work that we've got. But from Minister, with, with, with respect, this was one of the findings of our inquiry was that it was that it's certainly at the start of the pandemic, it was a very narrow range of disciplines mm. that were involved and that international experts were not involved in that. So, so that was one of the issues at mm. the start of the pandemic. So, so I, I, I've touched on, and I will come back to in a second, this point about the international uh, connections. But I do want to slightly push back on this idea that SAGE is some sort of haven of groupthink and like-minded individuals who've all got the same expertise. But it's just not the case, we as a government have access to all these different advisory groups, including SAGE, which is itself highly diverse intellectually and in terms of people's expertise. We also have the CMOs, you've heard from the deputy CMOs, uh, uh, OXO's own expertise, we've got Go Science. And ministers have access to uh, advice from a, uh, people with a very broad range of views in a very broad range of contexts, and they, during the pandemic, deliberately went out and took the views of all kinds of people uh, from minority uh, positions. Richard Feynman said that science is not a democracy and that's a very important thing to always grasp. Uh, and I think ministers were challenging of the evidence that was put to them. We talked a bit earlier in the session about the uh, discussion around Omicron and whether there be, need to be another lockdown. That's another example of where uh, ministers and the cabinet collectively um, uh, did stress test the data very hard and what um, was emerging. But I think, I think that it, it is sometimes overdone is to forget the sense of the fog of war that was happening for this novel pathogen and the uncertain evidence. I think there was actually a huge range of views about what was going on during SAGE, during the critical, in SAGE, sorry, during the critical early stages of the pandemic. We have, of course, trying to always trying to improve these things, hence uh, the connections into that international um, uh, pathogen surveillance network to make sure we're not insular, that we see everything happening all over the world, that's central 
the connections into the G7 and that centre for pandemic preparedness that I mentioned earlier on, which is, although it's a, just a unit within UXA, a decent sized unit, is, is the centre of a kind of spice web of our connections for the rest of the world to make sure that we are always further diversifying our uh, sources of evidence and that we are seeing everything that we possibly can across the whole world. Okay, good. Thank you. So I think you've half answered it in that you, there are greater international connections. It was one of our criticisms. Um, I'm not sure you've answered the first bit, but we'll move on. Um, but the avian bird flu is a current concern. Um, what role has SAGE played in, um, in advising government and what sort of advice have you received from SAGE on this? Uh, I'll have to ask Clara on this one, I'm afraid, on yeah. the avian bird flu, beyond what you've already heard from the Deputy CMA. Um, good morning. Um, so it's, while it's an animal, um, uh, Led. It's a DEFRA lead. SAGE hasn't been set up, I don't think, for avian flu. Um, but in terms of the Animal and Plant Health Agency, um, all of the um, uh, both surveillance, which UXA do uh, do a lot of, both for um, the birds themselves, genetic testing, uh, and surveillance of health, uh, of poultry workers, and so on. Uh, that is um, that is based on their advice. Uh, and then it would be a deferred lead in their agency in terms of the management of the avian flu outbreaks. If, if we saw any crossover, what, what do you envisage SAGE's role would be in that? So, um, obviously it would depend on the scale, but first of all, if there was, in terms of the threat to human health, that would go to uh, NERVTAG, the new and emerging uh, respiratory viruses threats group, uh, as in fact um, uh, coronavirus did. Um, and then if SAGE was stood up, uh, if the government decides to set that up for any emergency, uh, chaired by the government uh, chief scientific uh, advisor, if that was necessary. And how, how quickly do you reckon that would take, uh, that could be done? I mean, SAGE can be set up in a matter of hours. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Good. OK, Chris. Thank you. Uh, Minister, uh, obviously, if we impose a lockdown, there's going to be, it's going to protect us from the, the virus and the disease, but also it's going to have wider impacts on schools uh, wider healthcare and the economy. Uh, one of the concerns during, uh, not, not with the first uh, lockdown, we appreciate uh, why that was done in that way, but with the second and third lockdown, uh, that there wasn't a published impact assessment on those other areas. Uh, would the government reconsider uh, the position of not publishing one of those impacts? Because I think whether it's uh, people around the country and certainly members of parliament voting or making decisions <coughs> in this area, we should be better informed. So the first two things I'd say are just as pieces of reassurance is that I don't see any future in which we are doing uh, further lockdowns and there's no particular reason to think that there would be any such thing ever happen again. But to answer your question directly, of course we want to always improve uh, the information that is available to, uh, to members of this House and to the government. I think we would strain every sinew if we ever found ourselves in anything even vaguely similar again to make sure we had um, a full uh, you know, account of as much as of everything as one could um, give to the public. Lots of things are not knowable, but um, we would make every effort to make sure we <coughs> publish what we were good. Thank you. Okay, Dawn Butler. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Minister. Minister, um, can I just ask a couple of quick questions? Uh, we heard earlier that some of the preventative measures for the impending sort of triple threat of diseases over the winter, what we could do is maybe, you know, the washing the hands, the wearing masks, all of that stuff. Can I just clarify, have any masks been burnt? Uh, I'm not aware of masks being burnt, but I can ask Clara. I mean, there's a, there's a, there is a deliberate sort of PPE stockpile of uh, things that we need so we can search capability. I don't know about masks being burnt. There, I mean, certainly we have a large amount of PPE. Uh, the NAO has looked at this extensively. Uh, in terms of uh, where it is surplus to our requirements, there's a range of things donating uh, and uh, working out on uh, length of time and so on. Um, but if you want to know more detail on Mars specifically, uh, there's a range of um, things within the PPA stockpile. We can get back to you on it. That would be brilliant. Thank you. And, um, and, and just on that, I mean, the NHS was publishing weekly consumption data during the pandemic, which I think is important and important going forward if we are to face another pandemic. I just wondered, how did it, um, how did we come to buy five times as much PPE as we needed? So I think on both PPE and also t testing um, capacity, uh, there is a, a choice, a, a big choice about uh, what level of um, resilience you want and how much you are prepared to have that. And so for example, on testing, which we were discussing earlier in the session, 
we have made a conscious choice to have excess testing capacity. We will have the ability to scale testing far beyond the levels that we currently need it at, and we are therefore making sure that we do lots of things to make sure that those people are not simply standing around, that they're doing other useful things. But to be clear, we are paying a price, taxpayers are paying a price, for us to have that capability to scale very, very rapidly, which I think many members of this committee would want us um, to have. So generally, resilience comes at a price, and the same thing is true in PPE. Uh, at the start of the pandemic, all of us as members were frantically trying to get uh, everything that we could possibly happen, have to happen to get more PPE into the system. We now want to make sure we're not uh, back so in that situation again, and that involves two things. It involves both uh, having some degree of stockpile, one could debate the details of how big the stockpile should be, and the second uh, part of that is having a resilient UK supply chain so that we don't end up back in the situation we were in, where Thank there's you. a global scramble at the same time. So it was, it was deliberate to, to buy five times? As, as I, I, I don't know if I could tell you it was deliberate to buy a particular um, uh, multiple of, uh, of quotes what is needed, and it's often difficult to work out exactly what will be needed. You, it, it was certainly a decision in both these cases to have enough capacity to be able to surge and to meet the need uh, if it increases. And there is always a price to pay for having those kind of resiliences. Okay, and my last question, um, Chair, is is it just possible, um, because as we're looking at lessons learned and going back to our joint committee session, there's still some missing information. So I'm just wondering if it's possible to get a breakdown of uh, the PP that was provided from each company, please. I mean, if you can just provide that to the committees later on, that would be useful, please. We'll undertake to get you whatever we can. Brilliant, thank you. Thank you for concise answers and thank you, Dawn. James Morris. I just wanted to turn to social care because I think it's fair to say that, at the, particularly at the beginning of the pandemic, it was, there was a sense that decisions were being taken um, uh, about social care, which actually had a devastating impact on the social care system at that time and caused lots of, uh, lots of issues. And I'm just wondering, in terms of thinking about responding to future pandemics or in terms of planning, how do we make sure that the social care sector doesn't feel that it's being done to, that it's mm. part of the prepare, preparedness and planning mm. for a future pandemic? Right, it's, a, it's a hugely important question that we've thought a lot about. So I would say that uh, the relationship between uh, DHSC and the social care sector has been completely transformed by the pandemic and the things that we've done um, uh, uh, during it. And there are several headings I would group that under. Uh, the first is about data and knowing what is going on. So during it we created uh, the capacity tracker and we just have a thousand times more information than we used to about what is going on in the sector. We also legislated uh, last year to give the CQC uh, the inspection power over local authority social care functions and that will give us from next year even more data about what is going on in the sector. Can I, can I just go, uh, that sounds all good stuff, but can I, on, the, on the specific point, which is do, do you think that the, specifically to the Minister, do you think that our social care system is going to be adequately funded in the future to be able to cope with another pandemic and the issues that, 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 that come along with it? Um, because it, there is an argument that the reason the social care system was put under so much pressure as a, in the first wave of the pandemic was that it was in a very weakened state to start with. And successive governments have not funded social care adequately. So there is a kind of important point about its resilience and its, its capacity to respond. Uh, uh, the record increase uh, in funding that was announced in the autumn statement, I think is absolutely right. And I agree with the spirit of your question. So we're going to put in another 2.4, up to another 2.4 billion next year, and then up to 4.8 billion the year after. And that is to address exactly the points that you are raising to increase the capacity uh, in the sector, both for day-to-day -day purposes and also to have that kind of greater um, resilience. But just to, to reassure you on the, the scale of the change, I mean, everything has changed. The structures in the department are different. We have a DG in the department uh, when we didn't before. We have a chief nurse for adult social care, uh, Deborah Sturdy, who was not there before. We have a completely different agenda on it, a <clears throat> much more active agenda. We had the white paper on adult social care, which is about workforce and qualifications, data and the creation of digital care records, which will let you have a much better sense of how people are flowing around the system and also cut a load of bureaucracy and save people a lot of time who work in social care. We've had the integration white paper and again this huge push that we have going on about 
the greater integration of NHS functions with local authority functions. So on Once upon a time, they were quite poorly integrated. Sorry to interrupt, but to, 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 are you confident, and maybe, I don't know, with Michelle um, or anybody else has got a point, are you confident that in, the, in a future situation with a future pandemic that, um, that there, are, there is now a structure and a process whereby decisions that may be taken about social care um, will be taken in conjunction with the social care sector yes. and will reflect their concerns mm -hmm. and we won't get into a situation yes. that we got in, in the first wave of the pandemic when all kinds of decisions were made and which had yeah. quite devastating unintended consequences. Uh, um, yes, I, uh, I am confident that we have both the money and the better connections to the sector um, to deal with uh, future pandemics and I, I wonder if I could bring in Michelle just to talk a bit about her connections which are incredibly extensive in this. Leave it with, with you, Neil, if that's okay. Um, just because there are, I just want to bring in Paulette Hamilton, who's got a very specific question in relating to those record sums for social care announced in the autumn statement. Paulette, did you want to put your question 20? Oh, I thought mine was 20. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I thought it was about the OMS, about. Um, Health inequalities. Okay. Um, fine. Fine. Yes. Um, you 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 ask you ask your question, Paulette. The, the the question was just going to be about yes, we understand what you're saying about record sums, but of course that does rely on local authorities choosing to go to the five percent. The question does hang rather as to what if they don't choose to do that. That must concern you. So just to be clear, some of the money is just straightforwardly grants into social care. So we have the new Something. money, new money, additional new money from the Treasury going directly into the Better Care Fund. Uh, we have new additional uh, money going to the adult social care grants. We then also have the social care grant on top of that. And yes, there is also part of it is about council tax yes. uh, flexibilities. But just to reassure you, there are also new direct grants from central government into social care, about which there's no ambiguity or choice of going straight into social care. Yes. Um, but yes, there is... You know, localism, there is a role for local authorities in making right. choices. Okay, right. So editing out the last exchange, question uh, from Paulette Hamilton on health inequalities, of course. Right, brilliant. Um, <laughs> thank you, Minister. Um, the data from the ONS shows that the death rates during, COVID, during the COVID-19 pandemic was disproportionately higher for black and Asian ethnic minority groups. Can I ask, why did it take so long to understand the ethnic disparities. And secondly, um, I've had this thing about um, the information being in included on death certificates, which still hasn't happened um, as standard. And finally, um, I've done it all together, what is the department um, doing to reduce health dis disparities and will these be outlined in the upcoming white paper? So several crucial questions there. In terms of uh, the importance of this I absolutely agree and with my own constituency on the edge of Leicester, uh, a majority minority ethnic uh, city, it was something I was personally worried about as a constituency MP right from the start because I have a lot of large uh, multi-household um, uh, at homes in my constituency. And I think, in fairness to the system, very quickly in the pandemic there was great emphasis. As soon as we had proper data, proper testing, it could actually link up to uh, give some sense of what was happening with um, uh, hospitalisation and fatality rates. We, I remember very early on we started to see um, uh, that data about the, the disparities, the very concerning disparities in um, uh, the effect of the pandemic on uh, different uh, minority ethnic uh, groups and so there's a huge amount of work now going on to try and uh, uh, learn from that and to narrow some of those health inequalities um, overall. In terms of our kind of overall framework for thinking about this, as you know we've got the uh, goals to increase healthy life expectancy and narrow the gaps in healthy life expectancy between the best and worst areas. We also have the agreement across the NHS um, to use as a framework for doing that the so-called a core 20 plus 5 framework, which is about the 20% most deprived, plus a series of uh, ethnic minority groups, and then five major um, uh, conditions that we'll focus on that drive health disparities. And then in the Health and Social Care Act that we passed uh, the other year, we put a duty on ICBs to pay due regard to health disparities. And then, so as well as the structural changes, we also had uh, Kimmy Bainnock's four reports 
on COVID of minority groups, uh, which then led on to the uh, uh, Inclusive Britain Action Plan in uh, March, which led on to things like the Maternity Disparities Task Force. So there's a sort of change of framework, and then there's also a bunch of specific actions. So we are, for example, we talked earlier in this session about uh, driving uh, vaccine take up um, where it is lower. And to add to what the DCMO said, you know, we have seminars with face leaders, we deliberately choose uh, vaccination centres in places of worship, so we uh, get to places both in our national communications and our choice of uh, local advertising and targeted advertising, we have made efforts to drive up um, uh, vaccination. We've even used things like uh, vaccination buses and taxis and direct door-to-door uh, -door knocking, some of which I saw a bit in my own uh, constituency. So we're doing lots of things to drive up um, uh, vaccine uh, take up, uh, particularly in the groups where it's uh, low. In terms of our work on the elective recovery and busting the backlog uh, from the pandemic, uh, we have pressed all trusts to have a plan in place to identify disparities in that elective recovery and deal with them. In terms of things like blood uh, donations, which is a long standing issue, um, uh, we have a whole campaign going on at the moment, particularly for black. Uh, blood donors called Not Family But Blood, and we've done things like tie-ups around the uh, recent Wakanda Forever uh, movie, which has driven a lot of extra uh, black blood donation. We've also done legal changes, things like changes to the selection criteria, which previously were ruling out people from donating blood if they'd been to particular countries. We've taken a, a better approach to that. And of course, we've created the Office for um, uh, Health Improvement and Disparities, which launched in October. Uh, and that drives then a huge amount of other work that uh, tackles the causes of health disparities. For example, uh, the 900 million that we are uh, uh, investing additionally uh, into uh, the drug strategy that was launched last year. That takes us up to investing 3 billion uh, into uh, drug treatment over the next um, three years, which will hugely increase uh, the availability of treatment, give us something like another 55,000 extra places in drug treatment. Uh, we're doing things uh, like the Start for Life program, uh, which is again tackling the first uh, 75 authorities that are part of that program. Can I? Um, are are, are, are deliberately done, targeted to be the most yeah, deprived. Uh, the point was, the disparities on the um, around the death data. Mm. Will that be included on the death certificate anytime soon? Because that was part of the issues why we struggled at first to find out. What, what the proportions of the different groups were because it wasn't there. I, so I will undertake to go away and, and um, uh, pump faster anything that needs to be pumped faster on that particular front. I've seen lots of, I've been following lots of the data on uh, disparities in um, uh, ethnic minority uh, hospitalisation and death rates from the um, uh, pandemic and we now have a, particularly because of Kemi's four reports, a much better understanding of the things that then drove that. But if there is anything more we can do in terms of better understanding... Because I, I hear that lots have been done, but what I'd like to see is what has been the results from all this scattered work that has been done. And at the moment, I'm not hearing that. But thank you for that, Minister. And thank, thank you, you Paulette. Thank you, Minister. So then we're just going to wrap up now with a, a little one from Aaron Bell and from Rachel Mask, we'll start with Aaron. Yeah, thanks. Aaron. Thanks, thanks, Chair. Uh, thank you, Minister. Um, just continuing with health inequalities and disparities, the other thing we picked up, of course, was disparities within the workforce, and uh, particularly the fit of PPE to NHS and social care staff. You, the government has said that they've made more masks available. Are there still disparities in the pass rates for those masks? Um, and uh, how widespread is the availability of those masks? Do, do people know how they can get hold of them if they need them? Uh, so, yes. So, uh, as part of that uh, effort that I described earlier on to um, build up a more resilient UK supply chain, one of the things that's given us the ability to do is to have a wider variety of masks. And I, I think we've gone up from something like eight types of masks to 16, broadly speaking. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, we also provided a lot of additional uh, FITS testing, so something like 300,000 extra FIT tests so that more people uh, are, are able to get a, a truly uh, well-fitting mask. I think the success rate overall for FIT testing has, has gone up a bit from memory, something like 70 to 85%. But I don't think it is the case that there are uh, ethnic disparities in fit uh, now. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, if that's wrong, please do, do jump in. Uh, partly because we have been working to provide a greater range of uh, masks so that everyone can get the, the PPE they need. 
Well, the, um, in the response, the government said a current pass rate of over 80% on the range of masks currently available. If, if you were able to send to the committee the details of each mask and the pass rate, that might be helpful. Um, it, I, I, I will get, get you whatever we can get you on that one. Th thank you. And on um, people with learning disabilities, which my colleague Tracy Crouch referred to earlier, uh, have we been able to improve communications to improve vaccine uptake amongst people with learning difficulties? Uh, yes, you're so right. I'm so sorry I didn't mention this before. Yes, DCMO has been, again, going and doing seminars on this point, and there's been a parallel process to the one that I described on ethnic disparities in vaccine take-up for the learning disabled as well, with similar things happening in it. So apologies for not mentioning that before. Do we have any figures on, on the effectiveness of that work? Uh, I, we will certainly have figures on um, take-up rates, yep. which I'm afraid will continue to um, lag because there is a problem that we are trying to solve there. Uh, but I will try and get you an account of the efficacy of what we've been doing. Thank you, Minister. Excellent. And then just finally, Rachel Mascord, question on Evershield. Thank you, important. Minister. On Evershield, um, it's been <coughs> conditionally approved by the MHRA, and yet the immunosuppressed people remain unvaccinated, isolated, and at risk. The, your predecessor said that he hoped to have a NICE assessment prior to April 2023. NICE have said that it could be faster. Could you um, set out exactly where things are on Evershells and protection for the immunosuppressed? And will this also be um, as, um, effective against new variants? Yeah. So it's a very good question. So to answer it, I need to explain a tiny bit of the framework here. So normal process, as everyone knows, is that MHRA license things as safe for use and effective to some extent, and then NICE do work on cost-benefit economic analysis, they consult widely to get you better data on efficacy, and the process takes longer. During the pandemic, we had uh, Rapid C19, which is a group of an independent group of clinicians and scientists that recommended purchases on an emergency basis because of the nature of the pandemic and the pace of uh, what the normal NICE process looks like. And they judged that it was right on an emergency basis to buy antivirals for treatment like uh, Paxlovid and uh, Molnupiravir. And those things, were, it was judged with right to buy on an emergency basis because they are not very sensitive to uh, new variants. Whereas monoclonal antibody treatments like Evershield are quite specific to the nature of the spike protein because of the nature of operation. And this issue is not specific to Evershield. Um, uh, Ronoprev, uh, which is an antibody that we were using in the NHS last autumn, has actually been withdrawn from clinical policies because it wasn't uh, effective against Omicron uh, variants. And that group, Rapid C19, did not recommend buying Evershield through the emergency route, and it thought there was insufficient just evidence to justify it, and so it should go through the normal NICE process. And when, just to be clear, when the MHRA licensed uh, Evershield, they did so on the basis of older clinical trials data pre-Omicron, and noted that it might not be as effective against uh, newer variants post-Omicron. And in, in vitro tests, uh, do suggest it is in fact less effective against newer variants and in fact the USA's FDA and its Canadian equivalent have written out to provide this to patients uh, using it to warn them of this and at the moment uh, NICE has been reviewing the cost effectiveness of all the medicines that we use in the NHS to treat uh, COVID. Their draft recommendation on this is out for consultation and that draft suggests that Evershield uh, is not recommended for use as a COVID treatment, let's be clear, as a treatment for someone who's got it rather than as a uh, 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 pro uh, prophylactic. Um, so I, I totally understand that the decision not to buy it on an emergency basis but to go through the NICE route uh, is disappointing for some who are at worst of risk outcomes from uh, COVID. Uh, several things to say about that. The first is that um, the success of the vaccination programme has meant that the requirements for shielding that were there before uh, are no longer necessary. But of course there is still a shared national effort to uh, to, to behave sensibly, to use masks where appropriate, to not spread viruses, uh, to help those who are vulnerable and worried about these things. And within that group of people who are concerned, there are a smaller number of people whose immune system does put them at more risk, and we have in enhanced protections for them, free testing, more guidance on managing risk, and including access, quick access to those antivirals that I mentioned that we have bought. So if they do get it, the, the risk is further reduced uh, because we have those new technologies that we didn't have at the start of the um, a pandemic. But of course, Evershield was never going to be uh, 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 any kind of uh, protection against other dangerous respiratory uh, viruses like flu, which will always be out there. So we always need to be helping uh, protect those people 
uh, uh, by taking those basic steps that we can all take to protect them. And we are also uh, exploring very actively options for COVID antibody testing this winter to help those people who are worried or who have immunosuppression better understand their risks. So that's something we're working on uh, very actively. Very clear explanation. Michelle Dyson, Neil O'Brien, Clara Swinson, thank you very thank much. You. That concludes the third panel. Uh, Greg Clark and I are going to swap chairs for our fourth and final episode. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, and just while we do so, I'm delighted to spot on the screen uh, Dame Kate Bingham. Uh, Dame Kate uh, was chair of the Vaccines Task Force uh, from May to December 2020. Uh, she is a board member of the Francis Crick uh, Institute and is managing partner at SV Health Investors. Um, very grateful for your uh, patience. This uh, has been a session that has, uh, has overrun uh, a bit, but we're anxious to hear from you. Um, and, uh, of course, it's the, the case that uh, Dame Kate's work uh, in that relatively brief period of a little over uh, six or seven months uh, made us the first country in the world to be able to uh, administer uh, a vaccine uh, against COVID. Um, Dame Kate, perhaps I can uh, kick off with a question. Um, uh, you said in an interview uh, published, I think today, uh, with Die Welt, um, that the UK seems to have lost its leadership approach in vaccine R&D, vaccine manufacturing and procurement. In 2020, we were clearly world leading, but the UK went back to business as usual. So what's gone wrong? Uh, well, what's gone wrong is uh, there's been no uh, expert or leader that's put in place to coordinate um, the uh, activities from everything from vaccine innovation scale up, uh, landscaping, figuring out where the new variants uh, may come from, the new potential pandemic viruses, people understand manufacturing scale up, clinical development, regulatory. All of that is gone. I don't, I mean, maybe there's somebody secret out there but that that is doing that, but not as far as I can see. And there's no, we've got the capability in the country, but it can't be done in a vacuum. We need to have an expert leader to, to bring that together, to keep us, or to try and get us back into a, a better position. Um, you're not talking about a minister there, you're talking about a someone appointed, you just mentioned experience, uh, an expert to, to, to run this operation. Yes. Yeah, so, um, whether it, it, it needs to be someone who understands the space so that um, it probably means somebody from the outside who has that experience in industry. And it was the first recommendation we made. So when I left in December 2020, we gave some very specific recommendations as to what we thought should happen. And the first that I'm reading, an independent industrial experience chairman and board should be established to bring together the various strands of vaccine activities that will define UK as a global leader in vaccine development and manufacturing. That's not happened. Uh, and why has that not happened? Do you have a, a view as to that? Is it because it's been transferred into the UK uh, Health Security Agency and it's been discontinued in the model that you uh, worked in, which was a separate uh, body, the Vaccines Task Force? I mean, to begin with, I thought it was lack of experience of officials, since we don't have uh, a lot of people um, within Whitehall that understand um, vaccines, relationships with industry, all of that. But actually, I'm beginning to think this is actually deliberate government policy, just not to not to invest and not to support the sector. Because it, it I cannot explain why uh, we haven't uh, appointed somebody that can actually bring all this together, because we've got the capabilities, and yet systematically things are being dismantled that we put in place. I mean, our Joint Committee's report um, was very clear that uh, of all of the aspects of the response to the pandemic, the creation of the Vaccines Task Force and its work, yours, but with a, uh, you led a team uh, of people who gave extraordinary public service coming from outside government, was one of the, the beacons of success. Um, have, have you had any conversations with uh, anyone in government since as to why they thought such a successful model should be abolished? Well, I mean, through the Office of Life Sciences, the, as the, the announcement that was out on Monday is to create four missions uh, specifically to advance, you know, cancer, dementia, and so on, and that has been uh, apparently modelled on the Vaccine Task Force. And yes, I have been talking to them about how to bring that urgency and goal setting and delivery to, uh, to those missions. But no, I've not had a discussion about 
why, why the decision has been taken not to appoint anybody with this sort of experience to bring together the activities and the capabilities that we have in the UK. Nor have I had a discussion with anybody about um, why things that we did put in place are now being dismantled. Do you have an example of things that you put in place that are being dismantled? So VMIC, that was, um, this is the Vaccine Manufacturing and Innovation uh, um, Centre, uh, and uh, we scaled it up uh, through with Oxford um, Biomedica to help massively increase the manufacturing capability, um, in that case of the Oxford vaccine. And that was sold to Catalant uh, earlier this year. Catalant has now announced that they're mothballing any expenditure uh, into VMIC until 2024 at the earliest. So uh, far from uh, uh, supporting and investing in uh, manufacturing onshore, it's, it's been uh, sold and, and mothballed. So that's the example of Catalan. Uh, Cobra was bought by Charles River. They were a key part of uh, the early scale up for um, the vaccine manufacturing and getting first into the clinical trials and then actually ultimately in, in the bulk manufacture. Um, that manufacturing has been transferred and is being transferred to the US. Um, the, the bulk manufacturing for antibodies, we had interest from industry to uh, partner with government to build up that scale. And I noted the last conversation was about Evershield. I disagree with the comments that were being made, but there again, none of that has been taken forward. The NHS registry, I am a member of it, and I've had two emails telling me it's uh, closing down. I tweeted it, I said, I think that's a pretty dumb decision. Uh, and then uh, uh, Robert Jenrick managed to reverse that, but only after substantial goodwill has been lost. So 550,000 550, people who thought they were actually trying to help with clinical development in the country has been repeatedly told, you're not helping, you've got to start again and, and join a different registry. So I'm baffled as to the decisions that are being made. Uh, you pointed out in your last comment um, about why was the Moderna contract not signed. Goodness knows, it does not take six months to go from a heads of terms to a binding contract. And uh, you heard what I said to, uh, to the Minister on, on that point, that I seem to recall that you regarded as crucial that we had signed contracts that we could insist on, otherwise we wouldn't have got the supplies that we did that, that made such an impact here. Is that, is that a fair reflection? Of course not. I mean, people work to legal contracts. You've got to have a binding legal contracts to ensure delivery. So, I mean, I, I absolutely welcome uh, the concept of a big relationship with Moderna um, to provide and bring both R&D and manufacturing to the UK. So that I'm very positive about. Haven't seen it happen. I haven't seen, or do, nor do I know, whether or not the same offer was made to Pfizer-BioNTech, with whom uh, we have a close relationship and they've clearly delivered for the UK. So it just seems odd that, that, those, you know, that nothing has yet been signed. And it also seems odd to me that there is a singular focus on mRNA as opposed to maintaining uh, a broader capability across different vaccine formats. I mean, one of the key uh, lessons in our joint inquiries report was that we had to be better at uh, preparedness for future pandemics of, uh, of whatever type they were. Um, does the devastating assessment of what, you've, uh, what you see does that lead you to lose confidence in our ability to, to respond adequately to future pandemics? I mean, I don't think we are in a, in a much better place to deal with a new pandemic. I think we're marginally better. I think there's, there's a sense in the UK that, um, I mean, first of all, we're quite pro-vaccination. -vac That's good. Uh, we clearly did have a positive reputation, so other countries around the world clearly did see us as doing a good job. Um, and we do have some greater vaccine uh, manufacturing capability through the work that we did in terms of scaling up some of the existing um, suppliers, so the contract development manufacturing organisations. Um, and as I said, I think the concept of the Moderna contract is great, and we've invested in skills to support biomanufacturing uh, um, expertise. So all of that, I think, is really positive. but. Uh, without the leadership, without uh, having ongoing relationships to, to 
looking at vaccine innovation. Our vaccines currently are not good enough. We need to improve the, the quality of the vaccines, the durability, the ability to stop transmission, um, the way in which we give vaccines, lots of things that think need to be improved. And that's not going to happen in a vaccine, and that, in, a, in a vacuum. And that's where we need to bring together the capabilities that we've got, working in partnership, as we did effectively in 2020, to actually make sure we stay ahead of the game and not constantly looking in the rearview mirror. Before I turn to uh, a couple of colleagues, starting with Stephen Metcalf, uh, just one thing on uh, innovation. So the Vaccines Manufacturing Innovation Centre actually predated COVID. I should disclose it was part of the industrial strategy, and it was an assessment that we made that we needed to have this capability in manufacturing and innovation. Uh, I think my reading of what's happened with the VMIC is that the innovation mandate uh, for for the VMIC has been lost, has been deleted. Is that, is that, have I understood that correctly? That is, that is my understanding. Um, and again, it's not that we've necessarily lost the people, it's not, and the, and the skills, but we have, no, there is no leadership, there's no mandate, there's, that I in VMIC, as far as I can see, uh, has been eliminated. So we've lost the manufacturing side of it because it's been mothballed, and we've lost the innovation side because no one is actually continuing that or supporting that. So now, if we have innovative vaccines that want, vaccine companies that want to work with the UK to develop next generation vaccines, I don't know who they talk to or where they go. Well, I'm, uh, Greg, you've spoken very clearly and very uh, powerfully and concisely. Um, it may be that you've anticipated some of the questions that my colleagues uh, have, but nevertheless, I'm going to go to Stephen Metcalf. Um, thank you. Yes, I mean, my question, I think you have uh, pretty much already answered. I was going to ask what are the weaknesses in uh, UK capability to deal with new variants as they emerge, and I think you've sort of already highlighted some of those. Is there anything you would add to, um, to, to your, I suppose, you know, uh, thoughts on how we can become better prepared for new variants as they emerge? Well, one of the things that we invested in was um, scaling up the assay capability at Porton Down for evaluating new variants. And that, again, I think has worked well. Uh, it allows us to actually evaluate the effectiveness of vaccines against new variants as they emerge. Um, but again, there's no, as far as I understand it, there is no, no leadership, there's no one coordinating this, there's no one working with industry to, to basically work out what we, you know, what we could be doing to address these new variants. And, and if you look at it, I mean, across the industry, over 70% of new discovery, new drugs and vaccines being discovered come from small and medium-sized enterprises working closely with academia. So 70% of the industry is these small companies, and they do need to be able to work uh, with, with, a, with somebody in government to work out how they can scale up and evaluate their new formats. And that's not happening at the moment. No, I, I think that's come across loud and clear, and I think the one thing that will overcome many of the challenges you've highlighted is some proper leadership. Um, so thank you for that. That's all I really need to ask. Thank you very much. John Butler. Um, thank you, Dame Kate. Your, your frustration is palpable. We can feel it um, in the room. Can I just, uh, just a point of clarification, uh, do we have the infrastructure and manufacturing base to produce vaccines for a future pandemic? Um, broadly, I mean, we've got um, capability in the Cell and Gene Therapy Catapult, the, the Essex-based veterinary vaccine plant, that has some capability. We've got the contract development manufacturing organisations, so Oxford Biomedica, Fujifilm up in Darlington, Wachart. So those are all independent companies that we help scale up their uh, capacity. Uh, as I said, Cobra is moving a lot of, with its new US owners, moving a lot of the manufacturing to the US. Um, so we do have some capability. We don't have any capability to manufacture antibodies, bulk antibodies, and so we are dependent on external exports. So we're definitely better, um, but we are short of, of, of being able to do... Um, it, 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 we're short of being able to not depend on imports, because at the moment we are dependent on imports um, for certainly mRNA vaccines. Moderna's not going to get built anytime soon. CPI is the group up in Darlington also that uh, has, has developed a very fine process 
Um, but that's a low scale process, low volume uh, process, so that we can't scale population uh, vaccines there. Thank so you. we're better, but it's yeah. a long way away. Thank you. And I think the pandemic showed us how important it is that we invest in our own infrastructure so that we can uh, mass produce to scale. And there was lots of um, public money invested in developing the vaccine with Oxford. Um, and, but then when the vaccine was developed, it was offered at different price points globally. And I think that might have had an impact on the vaccine rollout in other countries. And in a pandemic, you know, if it's, if, if a, if a country has a prevalent uh, problem, it then spreads to other countries. So, you know, we can't sort of vax ourselves, vaccinate ourselves in isolation. I'm just wondering, um, what is the global value of having vaccinations made um, more for, with a focus on protection rather than profit? Well, just to be clear, the AstraZeneca vaccine was not sold at a profit. It was sold at a non-profit basis uh, to high-income countries and at a very discounted basis to low-income countries. So AZ, uh, GSK Sanofi, Johnson & Johnson all worked on non-profit basis. So these major companies forwent their profits they could make if they manufactured other products in order to provide vaccines. And because of that, the AZ vaccine, uh, according to The Economist, saved more lives in the world than any other vaccine. So I don't think profit was the motive uh, for those uh, vaccine companies. Uh, profit was a motive for the mRNA vaccine companies, uh, and those, com those vaccines were less widely distributed to the low and middle income countries because they were too expensive and too complex uh, to deliver with the very significant cold chain requirements. Yeah, can I just um, come back on that? I mean, you're absolutely right. AZ was uh, developed, of course, non-profit, but it was still offered at different price points uh, in some countries. Um, but, but again, I just, I just want a bit more clarity from you in terms of, I mean, AZ was more popular because it was offered at a cheaper price point than the MRA. Is, it, is that important if we're ever going to cope with another global pandemic? Is that important that vaccines are offered uh, as not-for-profit? Is that an important method to go forward? In order to, to control pandemics, we need to make sure that all those people who are most vulnerable uh, are vaccinated. And if there is uh, significant uh, costs to get vaccines, the low and middle income countries are not going to get those vaccines. So it is critical that everybody who needs to be vaccinated is vaccinated and done so in a way that is doable. And the AZ is not a, or has not been a vaccine company, yet they managed to stand up uh, license agreements with manufacturing companies all around the world to be able to, to manufacture their vaccine, as you say, at, at, at very low costs in some countries. And that is the right thing to do, yes. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you very much, uh, indeed, John. And just a, a final question, uh, a couple of brief questions from me, uh, Dame Kate. Um, the world's doesn't stand still, and other countries that might not have done as well originally have looked at our example. And I was struck by what you said about Europe. You said Europe is now thinking about pandemic preparedness in a systematic, professional, and effective way. They've put in place a comprehensive process uh, to explore vaccines of all modalities, with a budget for advanced purchase agreements, capacity reservations, uh, etc. Uh, they engage constructively with vaccine companies. It sounds like they've studied what you did and copied it. Is that, um, would that be inaccurate? Well, whether they've copied it or not, they've done the right thing, which is to, I mean, they were slow to get off the blocks to begin with, but they've now done what needs to be done, which is to recognize this is not going to be uh, the last pandemic, and we need to have a better and quicker approach to um, identifying uh, potential pathogens um, and man being able to uh, build vaccines very rapidly against new variants or new uh, pathogenic uh, or new, new pathogens. And they, they are doing exactly what we've recommended that the UK does. It just our approach seems to have been to go backwards rather than to continue the momentum. We've got a new Prime Minister, we've got a new ministerial team. Your advice to them would be to um, turn the vehicle around instead of going backwards, instead of going in the opposite direction from where you recommend, would it be fair to say it's not too late to, to change course? No, I mean, 
I mean, again, I think there are some things that are pretty uh, severe. I mean, I think remake is not a good outcome for us. Uh, but I would recommend to the, to the new Prime Minister and Ministers to go ahead and read the recommendations we gave in December 2020. Those recommendations haven't changed. And uh, I haven't shared them with Europe, but <laughs> they're certainly following a lot of them. Thank you. Uh, and one final, perhaps a uh, technical uh, question. Um, uh, on intellectual property, which is important in developing uh, new drugs and treatments, uh, we're in, the UK's in negotiation to join the Trans-Pacific Trade Agreement, the CTPPP. Um, the IP regime in that agreement um, differs from what we have in the UK now. I think it involves a year's grace um, for registering patents. Um, is that a problem? Um, is that something that negotiators need to be aware of to, to preserve our ability to have a flourishing uh, life sciences industry and get the benefits of that? Um, yes, it is. So that anything that puts us in contravention of the uh, European Patent Convention uh, would be uh, catastrophic. Our companies depend on being able to protect their, their products and intellectual property using uh, using patents and uh, if we are forced out of the European um, Patent Convention uh, that will basically cost our companies uh, significant uh, costs and hassle because we'll have to duplicate um, all of all of that work and the reality is our companies will just relocate so they won't be based in the UK they'll be based in in those areas where um, they can actually secure patent costs at, um, and patent rights at, at low costs. So it's, this seems to be a, a potential for an old, own goal, and we need to make sure that um, there is an opt-out from on the, on the patent, the intellectual property uh, clauses within this trade agreement. Otherwise, we risk really harming the biotech sector and our um, patent um, agent profession, which again, punches disproportionately above its weight um, with the, the patent work that it does uh, on behalf of international companies as well as UK companies. But that is a risk, not a certainty. So what you're saying is you, 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 you hope and want the, the negotiators to, to be cognizant of this and, and not uh, do something inadvertently that could be, as you put it, catastrophic. Correct. Correct. Uh, thank you very much. I think there are no other questions from colleagues. You have been um, admirably, remarkably concise, but at no cost whatsoever to the force of your evidence. So we're very grateful uh, to you for your evidence today, uh, Dame Kate, uh, and for the contribution that you made uh, to the development uh, and deployment of the vaccines during the pandemic. Uh, thank you very much indeed. That concludes this meeting of our joint committee. Order, order. The proceeding has ended. 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 The
The proceeding has ended. 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 The proceeding has ended.